Welcome to the Dickinson College Expert Show, where we take a few minutes to introduce you to experts from Dickinson College. I'm Craig Lane. Thanks so much for joining us today. And in the studio, I have Professor Emily Marshall. She is the Associate Provost for Quantitative Initiatives and an Associate Professor of Economics and Data Analytics. That is a mouthful. You are so busy. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Of course. I'm excited to be here. All right. Well, we're going to talk about data analytics and fantasy sports, specifically fantasy football. You're a data analytics expert. So let's start with that simple question. What is data analytics? Data analytics is such a broad field. Um, it's really kind of a challenging question to answer, um, but I'll do my best. Okay. So um, data analytics in the Vegas sense is just the process and the science of extracting information from data. All right. And there's a lot of other technical components that go into that. Uh, there are different elements of data analytics, everything from how we get data, how we collect data, how we wrangle data, how we use data, and then, of course, the analytical methods. Okay, so there's different ways to look at all that data. So you're just looking at pieces of information, right? That's the most important thing, right? And Th how, that's right. And how you can apply those. So in the world of sports, there has to be right? Hundreds of thousands of different data points you can look at. When we dive into fantasy sports, what are some of the things that people are looking at? Fantasy sports are such an interesting case study for data analytics and sports in general. So there are entire subfields of data analytics that study um, sports economics. And now a lot of or most professional sports and college sports teams have their own analytics and directors of research. So what we're doing, um, and on the academic side here, um, we study a lot of different aspects of athletics and sports and how um, we can actually use fields and sports competitions to study human behavior. That's how we use it um, in economics. The fantasy sports world um, is a little bit more for fun, right? Uh, lower stakes, but there's a tremendous amount of data available. And part of the reason that we use sports so often as case studies in economics, in data analytics, is because of the availability and the granularity of data. So there's everything from season level data, team level data, individual player level data. You can even get GPS level data, locational data on players' positions at different points in time. Um, so all of those different pieces obviously contribute to how the athletic competition plays out. Right. In fantasy, um, there are existing data metrics and expert rankings that a lot of people use as a heuristic when they're, for example, drafting their fantasy football teams. Um, there are also um, other ways that we can look at data if we have the availability and the skills and the tools, and I can talk to you a little bit more about that. Yeah, lo we'll love to dive into that. I want to ask you this really important question, though, first, which is, do you use your knowledge of data analytics in your own fantasy leagues? Yeah, so one of the <laughs> <laughs> one of the interesting uh, pieces of fantasy sports is that most of the time when we're using data, we're using it to study big markets, and that's true in the sports world, and that's how sports analytics professionals use it. But that's not how we have to use it in fantasy football. In fantasy football, you're not trying to beat the market; you're just trying to beat the ten other people right. in your league. So um, it's all about. Information asymmetry, meaning what knowledge you have, what knowledge the other people have that you're playing against. That's what's unique about fantasy football. Um, when I use data analytics and analytics in general in my fantasy football leagues, I have two fantasy football leagues. Um, one is almost exclusively PhD economists. So that one is a little bit more challenging to compete in. Um, and then the other one is actually people who know the sports world really, really well. So very different audiences in terms of draft strategy and, again, what information different people have in different leagues. Um, so do I use it? Uh, it depends on the year and how busy the summer is leading up to it. Uh, but yes, absolutely. One of my favorite things to do is kind of look at past season data. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but aggregate ranking methods and 
try to use it to um, my advantage. So do you come out on top because of this or, or is it, I guess I should ask this, is it more competitive in the PhD Economists League or in the Sports Knowledge League? Yeah. Because in my mind, I'm thinking <laughs> like fantasy football used to be a thing where you just like read narratives, right? You would read about a player or like what this player eats or like where they're from, who, who their friends are, what their lifestyle is like. All that would affect if you would pick them, right? So now you're looking at stuff that maybe, you know, no one thought about before. So, so which one of these is, is it the math or is it the like stories and the heart? Like what's, what's harder to compete in? Yeah, it's both. Um, <laughs> we're <laughs> one thing that, uh, economists are notorious for is trying to forecast and getting it wrong. Oh. And that's true in this setting as well. <laughs> so there are so many unpredictable elements, um, in sports, in the National Football League, um, that really, it's impossible to get it right. It takes a little bit of skill and a lot of luck. So there are so many random um, shocks that happen um, throughout the season, um, changes in personnel, for example, on specific teams. Uh, injuries are huge, huge contributor. Um, players get streaky. So um, players go through times when they are performing really, really well. Um, and times when they don't perform well at all. Um, there are really big impact players that um, score a lot of touchdowns and players that are much more known for just helping yardage or fourth down plays. Um, on fourth down plays usually don't give you a lot of fantasy points. Uh, so there's a lot of different um, aspects um, of fantasy sports, and I'm going to assume that my fellow players are watching this and be honest and say that I'm not usually very good. <laughs> So one of the things I just want to be absolutely clear on here is that this is just for fun. This is advice for fantasy sports. We're not talking about gambling here. Exactly. You know, I know you're, you're an Eagles fan. You're yes, wearing the colors. I am. So uh, we're hoping for, we're right at the, we should say this, we're right at the cusp. We're right at the cusp of a new football season, right? Yes. So is it harder to do data analytics and fantasy football than it would be, say, in, like, fantasy baseball. And the reason I ask that is because the fantasy baseball, um, the season, the baseball season is just gigantic compared to a normal football season. Just having a bigger pool of data to draw from, I'm assuming that's helpful, right? Yeah. So that's a challenge for fantasy football. Absolutely. Um, you're in a much shorter season, um, much fewer competitions, and so they're higher stakes. Um, at each competition is higher stakes. Um, so very different, I think, actually, than playing fantasy baseball, um, which, as you mentioned, stretches a much longer season, has a lot more data points, a lot more time for adjustment, too. Um, another unique aspect of fantasy football is, of course, trading. Um, and trading is, in my league with The Economist, I would say is actually more challenging. So we look at um, economic issues and trades as what is Pareto optimal. And Pareto optimality means that what can I do that makes someone else better off without making someone else worse off? Okay, so, that's very kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Economists can be nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, so it's interesting because there are certain trades that are truly Pareto, op Pareto optimal. So for example, if your team, you've got four star running backs, but you've only got one good wide receiver. And I've got four good wide receivers and only one good running back. It would actually probably be Pareto optimal, depending on the scoring structure of your league, for us to go about a trade. Wow. Okay. So this is, you're interested in improving the experience then, it sounds like. You want to make it more competitive. You want to make it a more interesting playing field then across that league. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. So what are some of the things that you look for? What Are there certain data points? Are there things that you uh, explore? And what are some of those, those key points? What should people be looking for in their fantasy teams? Yeah, so um, this all comes back to what information is available to different people. Um, the idea is that the more information that I have that you don't have, the better off that I'll hopefully be, um, assuming that my metrics are accurate, which is the biggest challenge that we face. So what most people do when they go to draft their fantasy football team, which is usually the biggest part of the fantasy season, um, is they look at the expert rankings. And there's lots of different websites that do this for you. So it's great to be able to have and to use that information. Um, what 
a couple of the other players in uh, one of my leagues uh, have done is to take those aggregate rankings and to try to make a new ranking that incorporates expertise across a variety of websites or fields. So there are lots of different sources where you can get that ranking information. The idea would be how can we take that and make a different ranking system or index that incorporates information from all of them. Most of the time they're pretty close, but sometimes there are slight differences in those rankings, especially when it comes to rookies. Rookies are a huge wild card uh, because obviously we have no past data on how they will perform in the NFL. We have college level data, but the college game is very different. So one thing that some of uh, my friends have done in one of our leagues is what's called principal component analysis. And that basically means, like you said, we have so much data, including these expert rankings, including data on past seasons. How do we take all of that and reduce it down to something that we can use that doesn't include 100 different elements? And so this type of analysis takes that big uh, dimensionality of data, that massive amount of data, and pulls it down um, into a much smaller set of information, but that still incorporates everything that you put into it. That's one way um, that you can go about it. There's other more sophisticated machine learning algorithms that people can use to try to understand what factors matter in predicting fantasy football scores. So as you know, um, there are lots of different statistics. By um, Most of them vary by player position, right? Um, and so this would be something where I would say what you're looking for in a running back is different than what you're looking for in a quarterback. So you can use by position – um, individual level data to try to talk about, okay, of all the different metrics that I have reported on a specific player, which one's most important for predicting their fantasy football score? Some of this is obvious, right? So we know that um, touchdowns count more than yards for a reception, um, but to what degree a player's ability um, to uh, you know, run a certain amount of yards or go a certain amount during the game – predicts their ability to get touchdowns is a different story. Um, there's also things that you can incorporate in that analysis, like division, um, rank of the quarterback. A wide receiver's ability to perform is likely, at least in part, determined by quarterback performance. So there are elements beyond just player statistics that we want to, want to include in analysis like that. And then something like machine learning, there are different techniques that you can use to say, okay, of these 50 data points that I have that I know might matter for predicting my wide receiver's fantasy score, which ones matter most? Got it. So you not only are looking at tons of data, you're filtering it for what the best data or the most impactful data will be. This seems like it's so complicated. So if, you know, you've been playing fantasy football for years and maybe you want to get into data analytics, is there a way to help folks sort of make that jump? How would you how would you help people make the leap? That's a great question. So I think one of the first steps is just understanding what data is out there, what data is available. Um, so paying attention to, um, for example, the ESPN statistics as you're watching a game. Um, I always pull up my game cast on my phone while I'm watching um, any professional football game and paying attention what's being recorded. What information are we getting about players? Um, what statistics am I seeing in the game that matter most? Um, I think that's the first step, is knowing what data is available and what data might matter for the questions that you're asking. Um, the second step would be just looking at some really simple statistics. You know, is there a basic correlation? Do I notice a pattern um, between a certain metric and player performance? And so paying attention to those trends, it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, you can just simply track how two variables move together. Um, and you can at least get some information from that. Beyond that, come to Dickinson and take a data science class, and we'll teach you all the techniques. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good advice. Good advice for sure. Or, uh, you know, uh, get a PhD in economics and then get in that league that you're in with all the economists. <laughs> right. uh, I can't imagine how... Um, awesomely nerdy that has to be, right? Totally. Yeah, that is that is very, very cool. What have we not talked about that you think is really important? And that's 
Uh, I know that's a very open-ended question, but what are some of the things when you think about data analytics, stuff that you would love people to understand, especially uh, folks who maybe are, like me, a little bit math shy or um, math averse? Is this still something that, that you, can, you can embrace? Absolutely. I think fundamentally data analytics does not have to be complicated. Uh, and it's important for every person interacting with the wider world to at least understand some basics about how data is used, how data can be misused, um, and how data visualizations are portrayed. So again, at a very simple level, we can do that with no math. I can show basic data visualizations and hopefully get to the point where people can understand them, interpret them, and understand when there's misinformation. Data analytics is such a huge field. What would you want people to know about it? Sure. So I think today we've had a really fun conversation about how data can be used in sports and in fantasy football. Uh, but one thing that I want people to know is that data analytics is not perfect. Um, and everything that we do is done with some level of statistical error. Um, and so we should always be cautious when we are interpreting information output um, from statistics, from analytics. Uh, the second thing is that this has been super fun conversation. And I love talking about these unique applications of the work that we do. Um, but data analytics is used in so many different places um, and for some very serious issues that our world is facing. Um, issues of social justice, um, environmental protections, economic issues. And I really hope that people can see both um, applications of what analytics can do. Absolutely. A huge industry and one that will only expand, right? Absolutely. We're seeing huge growth in the number of jobs um, that are out there for data analytics, data scientists, um, and I only expect that to continue. All right. We're glad you're at the forefront of it, and we're glad you're here at Dickinson. Thank you. All right. This is the Dickinson College Expert Show. Thanks so much for joining us today.